Hi. The art market is giving us a preview of what's coming in the stock market. Here is why. The world's assets, as I said before, are divided into three civilian categories and one military one. The civilian categories are real estate, stocks and bonds, and art. All are tied because when you make money in one, you can buy more of another. And if you lose money in one, you often sell another to meet a margin call. What about military assets? Armies, planes, ships, guns? In normal times, they are used by a country to defend its own civilian economy, these civilian assets. But at extreme times, they are often used to rob other countries of theirs. I'll get to this part later, but let's stick for now with art assets. The art market, as I said, is only beginning to crumble. First, because the money supply created by central banks was so huge that it created a bubble of new billionaires who all wanted to have social cachet and bought art to dress themselves socially. But second, this new demand both raised the price of existing real art, but also brought in new non-art masquerading as one, and it too has been selling for tens, sometimes hundreds of millions. The newly minted billionaires. Just like the king who was conned to put on invisible expensive clothes and thought he was dressed, but was really naked, so did many new billionaires buy non-art, paying for them a fortune. And this bubble is about to burst, in my opinion. So what is art? The only working definition I know of is that real art is that which lasts. If it has lasted, it is art. If it hasn't, it isn't. But for this, we must wait a hundred years or so to see what has been art today. What if we don't want to wait? Then it's good to keep in mind that the one thing all art must do is attract a human audience, keep its attention, and move it emotionally. And to do that, all real art must do two things and two only. If it's a book, once you start reading it, you can't put it down. And once you're finished, you can't forget it because it has changed you. Same things for painting. Once you see it, you can't stop watching it, even though you may not know why. And when you stop watching, you still remember it, whether it is a Rembrandt, a Lucian Freud, or a Jackson Pollock. That's it. Real art is irresistible and unforgettable. It is packaged emotions, true emotions. How does it do that? Two London art dealers, brothers who managed to collect the best master painter's work, said that the only test for art for them is the artist's broken heart. If the artist had a truly broken heart, true emotion, his painting has a chance to last. If it didn't, it probably doesn't. Just like real business must serve a true real need, it must be real, not just clever. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because the current art market, in my opinion, like the internet craze in its 2000 peak, is a bubble waiting to be burst. And like those long gone money losers masquerading as real businesses, so there are now plenty of so-called artworks masquerading as real art. Warren Buffett once said, only when the tide goes out can you see who doesn't have bathing suits on. He meant it for stocks, but in my opinion, it is also true for art. To deal with the new billionaires and the new art supply, the biggest dealers, Christie's and Sotheby's, took on big liabilities, both buying artworks into their own inventories to prop up the price and getting guarantees from outside financiers who in effect buy and sell calls and puts on their artworks to help the dealers bid for works coming up for sale. Like brokers, firm bid underwriting, if you will, for stocks. And in the last stages of the art bull market in 2018 and 2019, a lot of such liabilities were taken on. Only now, when the bull market has finally died, many works of art and art are coming for sale, but there are few buyers, if any. Now you may ask, since I sleuth and buy stocks, why do I watch the art market at all? Because, as I said, the art market is the third largest asset class, and as such, it gives us a good heads up on where the other markets are going. But because it is the smallest asset class and is largely private, it is more volatile and also has more chicaneries and frauds in it. Saying little about the huge commissions paid to auctioneers, 10 to 15% of the art value as compared to 1% in the stock business. This part, of course, is not new. I remember how when I lived in Paris in the 70s, when I still had black hair, art auctions used to take place in the Hotel Drouot. Since I like art, I used to go to watch the bidding. One day, my Parisian cousin, who knows how Paris really works, told me it was all a show. 
the dealers colluded in not counterbidding each other. So one of them always got the good works for very low prices and then sold them privately to collectors and all dealers share the extra profit. If a newcomer dared to bid on his own directly, the local mafia, the Union Corps, would break his legs. Pour encourager les autres, as they say. The police most likely knew about it, said my cousin, but rumor was that they too got their cut. Today, however, it is all institutionalized, but the principle is about the same. The art market is mostly a cyclical wild bazaar of both good and best stuff, where like the stocks, only about 10% of the merchandise is really worth owning, and where towards the end of the cycle, suckers are brought in by selling them pieces of the 90% not worth owning, or of the 10% it really is, at exorbitant markup after the insiders got their cut. Indeed, at the end of this cycle, they came out partnerships selling pieces of Picasso and pieces of Andy Warhol paintings to those without much money who still want to participate. In other words, sort of ETFs for the pooled art masses. It's like getting stock tips from a cab driver. It's a sure sign that the market is about to dive, and this has indeed begun. But again, what are the implications for the stock market? There are two. First, art is a large liquid market, mostly private, but it is fed by profits from real estate and stocks, by 5% art lovers who know art, but 95% of social climbers who can be bullied into buying a scribbler like Basquiat or modern decorators like Andy Warhol or all the decorators like Salvador Dali. In other words, marginalia. Just like the fly-by-night rinky-dink IPOs coming out at the last gasps of a stock bull market. But remember, the stock market is priced day by day, so you can see it plunge. But the art market is not, so you may not get a true feeling for prices unless in public auctions. And I doubt you'll see many of those by Sotheby's and Christie's anytime soon, because this would lead to true price discovery and knock down the value of their inventory. It will also make the clients mad at them because one of the unstated obligations of a broker selling art, like a stockbroker telling a company public, is to support the stock, or as I say in the biz, be the box in it. But this can be done either by bringing in new suckers to take the overpriced item off the broker's hands, which takes salesmanship, or at the extreme, taking the broker's own inventory with the help of outside financiers. But in a, li a liquid falling market, the last one is poison especially since both Chris's and Sotheby's and other auctioneers had to rely on so much outside capital guarantees to toil the machinery. And these outsiders are now mostly gone with their own art falling too. Bottom line, in my opinion, the art market is the first sick canary in the financial mine. It is lying on its back, gasping as the financial oxygen runs out. Next to go is real estate and the stock market. They have only just begun to fall begun to fall. As for real estate, I let other mavens pronounce on it, but as for stocks, I stand by my opinion, we'll see the S&P halfway down from the top before the bear market is over, which will be about 1800 or 1850 on the S&P, with lots of traders then wetting their pants. But you may ask, why would the market stop there? Where would come the money to prop it? In a word, conflict and war. Because, like armed passengers on a lifeboat, with only one can of water among them, when they become real thirsty, they'll resort to use their guns to grab the water wealth held by outsiders, by others, which is necessary for their own survival. Later, they'll invent reasons why this grab was necessary, but first they'll do it when the need becomes acute, just like debtors in the market. The US owes a lot of money, and so does China. And, just like bankrupt France, after the French Revolution raided Europe for wealth to pay off its own debt. And just like bankrupt England, after the Napoleonic War raided India, so will the US and the West have to raid China in one form or another to pay off their own profligacies. Or the other side, China raiding the West to pay off theirs. What reasons will they both give? Whatever story will be made up later on the fly, the true reason would be necessity just like grabbing the water on a lifeboat. And by the way, when Napoleon raided Europe after the French Revolution, when France was bankrupt, he brought with him a lot of art dealers and curators to pick and choose the best artworks of the countries he conquered. These artworks are today in the Louvre Museum. The best artworks that England got in its global raids of India, Egypt and other countries 
are today in the British Museum. It is the same for Ottoman, Turkey, ancient Rome and other empires. The bottom line, I think that the art market is giving us a broad hint where the stock market is going down. But in my opinion, history also gives us a hint that the US and China in the next one or two years will find it financially necessary to ratchet up the conflict because the only pot of money big enough to pay off each of their debts is held by the other side and the other side would not give it peacefully. So this should bring new risks and new opportunities. In the future clip, I may touch on both. Most analysts analyze only one side of the equation, the three civilian assets. I also look at the fourth one, the military, in the next future clips. But remember, all these are speculations of mine, not recommendations. I'm being descriptive, not prescriptive. But I do encourage you to put these under my name in your little black book of tracking others' forecast, as well as your own. We'll revisit them in the future. Until then, let me know below in the comments if you like this, and subscribe to the channel, then tell your friends so they can subscribe too. I'll see you next time. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching.